Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to Sabbath School this morning, where we will be studying Indestructible Hope, which is part of our crucibles um, quarterly that we've been studying. So welcome, and we're happy to have you here. Before we get started, we will ask our panel if we have any prayer requests or praise reports um, from the past week. So Lindsay, Janet, any prayer requests or praise reports? Yes, I want to praise God for um, safe traveling mercies and um, also my my son is getting ready to start school already. The summer is almost done. And um, during the summer, the teacher that we thought he was going to have and we were excited to have, she ended up moving to the West Coast. So um, we're excited that he has a new teacher and that things look like they're going well we get to meet the teacher today and we're just we're excited for the school year and the things the lord has planned yeah and i want to tell god thank you for keeping us healthy i was reflecting over the past weeks and said you know no one has been sick and that is a blessing because around us we've had people who have contracted who've contracted covid but um within the household. Nobody's been sick. So I want to tell God, thank you for that. And I also want to give him thanks because um, we've been praying for my oldest son here within our group and within the family. And I'm thankful that he is making strides to get his life back under control. And I'm praying and asking God to continue that because um, the relationship and the communication has uh, expanded. And with that, I see how God is working. So I tell God, thank you so much for that. And just give him praise and glory and honor for us believing and him being faithful to his word. And also want to um, give God praise for friends that we've been praying for um, in a health situation, that even though the answer was not the way that we thought it would work out, that in the midst of it, God and the Holy Spirit has been bringing comfort to the family. So I want to give God praise for that also. Amen for that. And I want to give God thanks for, for traveling mercies as well. And just uh, being with our family, we've, our family's been through a lot in the last four or five months with deaths in the family and memorials and the whole nine. So just a, that time to just breathe is always good. So praising God for that. Any prayer requests? I know we had a few that were interwoven in the in the praise reports. Yes, yeah, so still pray for our oldest son that God will give him discernment and most importantly direction and to send the right people to minister to him. So, and then also for decisions that uh, are upcoming in, in our family for health situations. So just pray and ask God to continue being faithful in that regards also. And I, I just want to pray that the Lord is, um, not that, not that the, even that the Lord is doing anything different that, but just to pray that the, we're more aware of the Lord's presence in our, um, in our relationships and, um, in our community. And to pray for our church as we transition our leadership over, um, from, with nominations and it's a lot of new things happening. So that's very exciting. So just pray for those new leaders that we have coming in. Yes. All right. If you don't have any other prayer requests, we will ask Sister Janet to pray for our prayer requests and to open our Sabbath school. All right. So shall we go through the Lord in prayer? Only Father, you are so awesome. We give you thanks and praise for the way that you have worked in our lives in the past and the way that you continue to guide and direct. Lord, I pray that you would forgive us of thoughts, words, deeds, or actions that we have done that would cause us to be separated from you and that you will filter us through the blood of Jesus so that we can come before you and just offer up to you a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And so, Lord, I've been praying for... Um, our older son, and just ask that you will give wisdom in his situation and discernment. And also pray that you will do the same for the families that are represented here. And then also for others who may be praying for their children. 
I pray also for family decision in regards to health and just thank you that you continue to be faithful. And I pray also, dear Lord, that many people who are in positions of authority, like our church leaders and our pastors, and even the new people who are coming on board for a nomination committee in our church family, that you will minister to them and give wisdom and insight and that you will make the transition smooth. And we pray also, Lord, that um, as we, your people, experience changes, that we will feel your presence and that we will be quick to give you honor and glory and then also to have quick ears to listen. Thank you for this time of worship and for our lesson study that we're going into. It has been so awesome to see that throughout the years and over the centuries, you've been giving us hope. And so we just ask that as we talk about this, that someone somewhere will be brought to conviction and that they will realize that you do have a plan. And part of your plan there, Lord, is to provide for us and to fill us with that desire to be with you when you come. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that opening prayer. And let's hop right into this indestructible hope. Um, and I, this lesson does have a lot of depth to it, and we're going to hop into that. But one of the things that um, the Sabbath lesson talked about was how there was a, a analogy of a lion. And it asked, is the lion safe? And the person was like, he's good. Um, and so understanding how God works. So I have a pre-question that we're not going to answer right now, but I'm going to throw the question out there. And this is going to be our wrap up question at the end. So the question is, how do we build a hope not based on who we think God should be, but who he actually is? And so as we go through the lesson and look at all the different facets of hope and how God has shown us this, let's keep that in mind because I will come back at the end and ask that question. All right, so let's get started with our um, our lesson and was talking about one person in particular, Habakkuk. So we're, we're going to read Habakkuk uh, chapter one, verses one through four. Or Habakkuk. It depends on how you want to say it. It was Habakkuk what? Chapter one, verses one through four. Okay. I can read that. All right. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. O Lord, how long shall I cry? And thou wilt not hear, even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that, and there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore, the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. Okay, so as Habakkuk is crying out to God, what response do you think he expected? I mean, he's saying all of these things. You're like, all these things are before me. There's evil, there's violence. What do you think he was what, trying to get out of God at this point? Or what did he expect to get out of God? God is going to save me. Why would he not want to save me? I am crying. I'm pouring out to him. I am lamenting. Yeah. I mean, he like laid it on thick too. <laughs> it's not fair. That's what I heard out of it. It's not fair. It's all bad. It's no good. Not fair. All right. So let's look at the response he actually did get. Let's read verses five through 11. And I can read that one new international version says, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if I were told, even, sorry, even if you were told, I am raising up the Babylonians, that rootless and impetuous people who <laughs> sweep across the old earth to seize dwelling places, not their own. They are feared. They are a feared and dread people. They are a law to themselves and promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than lepers, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. 
They fly like a vulture, swoop into the bower. They all come bent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert swin and gathers prisoners like sand. They derive kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all fortified cities. They build earthen ramps and capture them. Then they sweep past like the wind and go on guilty men whose own strength is their God. Okay. So Habakkuk comes and he's like, he's complaining. He's like, God, there's all this violence. There's, you know, I'm surrounded by it everywhere I look. And it's, it's just bad. Please help, please help, please help. And God's response to him is what? I'm going to send worse. <laughs> just like wait. Worse. They're good worse. Like they're, they're the worst of the worst. They're so good at being bad. That is not funny. <laughs> Wow. Terrible and dreadful. And I think it's interesting that it says, look at the nations and be amazed. So it's almost like, he's like, watch what's going to happen here. Um, and so how do you think Habakkuk felt at this point? Maybe I should Worse. not have complained. <laughs> What'd you say, Janet? <laughs> Maybe I should not have complained. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I should have been content with the bad I had. <laughs> and so let's look at what happens then. Let's get down to, um, because Habakkuk does go on to complain some more after this. And he's like, you know, you, you told us that they're going to come. Um, you're just in this, but you can't allow all this to happen. Please, please, please. He's begging at this point. Uh, let's see. So he should have learned from the first time. He didn't. He complained again. Let's read uh, chapter two, verses two through three and see what God says to him after the second complaint. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run and readeth it, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end, it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. So why do you think in the midst of all this bad news, God then tells Habakkuk to go and write this vision down? And how was that supposed to give him hope after hearing all of these terrible things are going to happen? I think it let them know that God knew what was happening, what was going to happen. He could see how bad it really was. Like he was um, sympathetic um, to the situation and yet he was still in control and that he would see them through it. I think it's also um, telling when God told them that there was an appointed time. Mm -hmm. And so the hope in that is, as Lindsay said, God told him it's coming, but God also told him, I know when it's going to happen. It's not going to be haphazard. So that gives hope in that situation. And then if we go over to chapter three, um, let's look at verses 16 through 19. Habakkuk 3, 16 to, through 19 says, 19. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay swept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nations invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vine, Though the olive crops fail and the fields produce no food, though they are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stall, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. The, the, sorry, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on to the heights for the music, I'm sorry, for the director of music on his strings. That was kind of 
strange at the end there. Oh, it, I think it was like a direction that this yes. was a song. <laughs> Caught me off guard. Yes. <laughs> so what changed from the from chapter one and chapter two, or mostly in chapter one, where Habakkuk was complaining and, you know, saying, God, please take this away from us. And, you know, we need you to come save us now. And to where he's now praising God for these trial trials that they're going through. What do you, what, what do you think happened to, to get to this point? It was like his, he no longer had his hope or his, uh, his satisfaction in what was going on in his world, you know, his physical reality, but instead it was his, uh, his rejoicing was in God. Mm-hmm. God was his strength and his focus. And I think it's interesting, like he goes through, like knowing this is going to happen. I'm waiting for them to strike. I know that this is going to be this desolation, um, but God is my sovereign God. So in looking at that experience and in reading that part of the song, that of praise that he's singing, how can we or how does this experience mirror what we go through today as we're looking at the signs of the times or prophecy? Um, and how can we kind of lean on this type of hope to get us through our daily desolation that we know is coming? I think it's the same thing that, um, and I think this is something I personally struggle with. When I think of my praises, I think of the things that God has blessed me with or the people that God has blessed me with or the relationships that he's blessed me with. And those are all good things, but my, my true joy should come with the fact that I know such a wonderful God, Mm -hmm. you know, and that I know that he cares for me and what he's already done for me and just the, who he is. And I think that is what Habakkuk is, at the end is able to rejoice with just simply that he knows God who is so wonderful that that's enough more than enough. And I I think one of the other things about this is that in looking at God's responses to Habakkuk, it almost makes him step back and take himself out of the daily you know, what he's seeing every day and what he's going through, how he's feeling every day and to see the big picture, which is the name of this lesson, to see what the entire landscape looks like. Because you know, if you're you're working on an art project or in, in anything and you're so hyper-focused on that one piece you're looking at, sometimes you lose sight of what the entire canvas should look like and how it mm-hmm. all works together to make a beautiful picture. Mm-hmm. I think it's that same thing where God's showing him, okay, I understand you want this to happen, but all of this has to happen so that this can happen. And so I need you to look back and say, this is just a small part of the greater plan that I have. Because, you know, our plans are never as God's plan, the same as God's plans, because we cannot think anywhere close to how God thinks um, when it comes to this. So I think that's also an important part to realize is that sometimes that step back and even looking at prophecy today, that step back to say, there's more than what we go through daily And this is why it's all a piece of the grand plan of salvation. All right. And in that one also, the remembrance of the person who was involved in those plans before we came on the scene is still Mm -hmm. the same person that's involved in the grand scheme while we were going through it. Mm -hmm. And God doesn't change. So if he was Mm -hmm. able to hold fast those things that happened before our time, that were just as bad or maybe even worse, he will do the same. I think it's important to remember that too, um, as we look at this. And so there's a a quote that is in our Monday's lesson that says, Oscar, uh, it's not Oscar, Oswald Chambers writes, have you ever been asking God what he is going to do? He will never tell you. God does not tell you what he is going to do. He reveals to you who he is. And that is taken from my utmost for the highest back in 1963. So what does this mean to you? And I'll read it again so you all can hear it. Have you been asking God what he is going to do? 
He will never tell you. God does not tell you what he is going to do. He reveals to you who he is. You know, at first, I think that could be, or it is, I think it's frustrating from our perspective because we want to know what's going on. We want to know what's happening next. We want to be in control. But the truth is, is that that's not what's best for us. Mm -hmm. And we might be asked, for that you know to know what's going on but he wants to give us better you know you think of um the the crippled man and uh peter and john they said silver and gold have we none that's what he wanted he wanted money he felt like that was what he needed that was the obvious solution for his problem but he said no i don't have that but i'll give you what i have and that's kind of a god god sees bigger than um what we think we need. And he wants to actually reveal himself. The God of the universe wants to reveal himself to us. Um, and uh, sometimes we miss it. I know I, I, at least I do. Sometimes I'm just, I'm focused on one thing and he's revealing himself and I'm missing it. So um, that was an insightful quote. What about you, Janet? What do you think that, what does that mean to you? The first thing I thought about was when God told, um, in the Bible, he tells us his name is I am. Mm -hmm. And with that, it doesn't tell you what he is. It tells you who he is. And when you look at situations where he brings you through without you knowing what it is that you're going to experience, you're forced then to trust in him because of the unknown but the solidness of hearing or knowing that the I am this is everything all encompassing is who is taking you through it who has your whole situation in his hand puts you in a different place it puts me personally in a different place knowing that okay I'm a control freak and I need to know what's going on but without being in control in the situation and feeling the chaos of it, I can rest on knowing that God is who he said he is and he's going to bring me through. So. I think there's a lot of times we have to learn that lesson multiple times. Um, Daily for me. Yes. <laughs> um, just understanding who God is. And I think there, so there's a person we're going to talk about right now that had to learn that the hard way. And when I read this, I was just like, Ooh, okay. So Job, you know, he went through a lot. He lost everything. And I think we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Yes, we did. He lost everything. He had only had his wife and his friends and his life essentially at that point. And his wife was like, curse God and die. And he's like, no. And then his friends come and give him bad advice. And so he got to the point where they had kind of worked on him and eaten him away to now he's starting to question God. Um, <clears throat> so he's like, God, you know, what's going on? Why this? Why is all of this? And so God starts giving him some answers. And we're going to look at a couple of those answers um, that happened when, when Job asked God, why are you doing this? And what, you know, to me and trying to kind of take control, as Janet said, being a control freak and want to know what's happening, why it's happening. Uh, so let's look, we're going to go through a couple of verses in chapter 38 of Job first. So we'll start with Job 34. And what verse in 34? Uh, chapter 38, verse 4. Chapter 38. Hmm. Um, I'm reading from King James version. I forgot to mention that, but Job 38 verse four says, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Okay. So God's asking him, Job, you're asking these questions. Where were you when the foundations were laid? Do you understand that? Uh, you now let's go to say it again, Janet, before you move on, just yes. sit, sit in that for a second. 
you know, sometimes I feel like as an adult, when children ask me certain questions, that's the response that I want to give them for certain situations. And in this situation, Joe was like, I've had enough. And God, you're going to answer my question. And God is like, okay, Job, sit down for a second. Let me tell you something. Mm -hmm. Where were you when I put all of this into perspective? Answer me that. Yep. And I I look at that as God with the attitude, if there's such a thing. And so we look, we're going to go through a couple of those that makes it even like get deeper. So verse 12. Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days and caused the day spring to know his place? So it's not even, where were you when I created this? Have you ever told the morning to start? Um, and in the New Living Translation, it says, have you ever commanded the morning to appear and cause the dawn to rise in the east? Second. And then it gets deeper. Let's look at verse 18. Hast thou perceived the breadth of the earth? Declare if thou knowest it all. Ooh. <laughs> and so God, you know, he continues to go through and he talks about, um, have you ever caused it to rain on the earth? Um, do you know how the animals are give birth when the deer gives birth? Do you feed these animals? Um, do you know why the ostrich lays an egg and leaves it there? Where the other birds take care of it, and why she's so silly to leave it, knowing that she has beasts out there to eat the animals. I mean, it. I think knows. my favorite one is when he asked me about holding the snow in the storehouse. Yes. Yeah. Do, do you know who how I hold the reserves of the snow and the hail for when there's wars and battles? I mean, if you have not read chapters thirty-eight and thirty-nine of Job, do it. It's better than any reality show where God just kind of goes in on Job and he's just like, "Listen, thing, listen, guy." I created you. Don't ask me questions. Let me go down this list. Um, and so Job, he kind of had enough. Um, and he comes to God and he goes, okay, God, yes, you are the almighty. You have put me in my place. You have told me all about myself up and down. I acknowledge you are God. And God's like, no, 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 no. You're not going to stop me yet. I'm not done with you. So let's read chapter 40, verses 9 and 10. You said 40? Yes, 40. Uh, Chapter 40, verses 9 and 10. Do you have an arm like God's? And can your voice thunder like his? Then adorn yourself with glory and splendor and clothe yourself in honor and majesty. Wow. The guy's like, just in case you did not get it the first time with all the other things I said, you can't do that. So enough. We're stopping here. Um, and so I think that in the showing, God showing us who he is, this is a, a great, it's almost like a list, a checklist of who God is. But when we start to get too big for our britches, this is very humbling to read, to go, this is why God is who God is. And this is not all that God has done. This is just the things that he told Job, you know, can you do this? I've done this. Um, so let's also jump down to uh, chapter 42, verses one through six. This is when, after God finishes with all of this, um, what Job responds to God with. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee and I will speak. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. I have heard thee of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. So we can see that hum, that humility, um, the humbling of Job's spirit here. So why do you, what do you think God was trying to show Job? And then we talked about this a little bit. And do you think at this point, he truly understood what God was saying? God did I think, not. Go ahead, Lindsay. 
I was just going to say, I think as much as a human could, yes. But not entirely, because he's still human. <laughs> and what were you going to say, Janet? I was going to say, God didn't answer Job. God basically laid out his resume, a portion, probably just the intro part of it as to who he is so that Job could understand not to question God, but to trust God. Mm -hmm. Because if I am God and I have the ability to do these things, I'm not telling you that I did, I'm asking you to consider that these are the things that I did, then you need to trust that in your situation, I am greater than all those things and better than what you could even imagine. And for Job to see that what his situation was, was minuscule in comparison to what God has done. I think that's a very good point to bring out there, Janet. Um, and I think it's interesting that after this point, it ends the chapter because God then blesses Job with more than he had before. So it's almost like he, because at the beginning of the chapter, you know, Job started off with, you know, you bless me with all of it. You give it and you take it away. And he had the trust and that he was just worn down and worn down and worn down to the point where he's questioning. And God's like, remember all of this. Um, you're the same Job. I'm the same God. Let's get back to that point. <laughs> and so one of the things it says in the lesson is hope and encouragement can spring from the realization that we know so little. Mm. It's true. So how can focusing on the greatness and character of God help us through trying times and our personal crucibles? I think I come back to the example of a small child. Um, my daughter, she's scared of dogs and, and, you know, she, she's getting better and, you know, she adjusts, um, it takes her a little bit to adjust, but initially, you know, she see a dog, she sees a big dog jump out from nowhere and she just completely loses it. Um, so she runs to mom, I pick her up and she might say, you know, I'm scared or whatever the case may be, but I just have to say, Hadessa, I'm here. Okay. I'm here. I'm not going to let the dog bother you. You know, I'm not going to let the dog get you. And she has comfort, even though I'm not that much bigger than her. You know, I'm a couple times bigger than her, but I'm not like the difference between me and God. You know, I'm, I'm bigger than her and she can trust that she's safe because I'm with her. And I think that that same thing goes because we don't have to worry because God is that much bigger. And even though he, he allows some things to happen, it's still not out of his hand. And we can just, we can focus on how great he is um, and how powerful he is. And we can have comfort because he's on our side. I think it is, go ahead, Jen, you have something. Oh, no, I was agreeing with her because that is a great analogy. And I think it is important to know that God is with us through all of it. Um, and we're going to look at how the Jews kind of learn that same lesson. Let's read Isaiah 41 verses 8 through 14. And I'll read something while we're getting there. So it says, God's presence seemed very far away from the Jews in exile. And while the actual return to Jerusalem, Jerusalem was still many years in the future, God wanted his people to know that he had not moved away from them. Kind of like Lindsay, you were talking about with telling your daughter that I'm here. So let's read Isaiah 41 verses eight through 14. I have that Isaiah 41, eight through 14 says, but you, O Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth and from its furthest corners, I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. 
I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. All who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all. For I am the Lord, your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Do not be afraid, O warm Jacob, O little Israel, for I myself will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. And so we knew that this, we, this was not, they knew nothing was going to happen right away. So this kind of hope was in that that midst of time when they were wondering they were wondering where is god what is he doing so how can what the jews went through compare to our present day woes well for one thing we're in a world filled with sin right there are things that go on you know you might read about on the news but there's things that are much closer to us you know um people that get sick and don't deserve to get sick there's uh physical things that happen to people there's uh i mean there's a long list of horrible things that can happen to someone yet um that's that's not the end, you know, just like the, the children of Israel, they were in exile. They were surrounded by, you know, people that worshiped idols and they weren't able to, um, live freely as they had before. And it's, it's the same for us. You know, we're, we're, uh, living in a world that's in bondage to sin, but God is still there and he still promised deliverance, even though it's not our own timing. And so when you read promises such as this, where God says, I understand that you're not in the place you want to be. It's hard to go day by day, but I'm with you through it all. And I think one of the um, main verses is verse 13, for, for I am the Lord, your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. When you read things like that, how does it give you hope? as we go through when someone's sick or when we just turn on the news and we don't even have to turn it on anymore. We carry it around with us now. It's changed so much in the last 20 years um, to where the news pretty much comes to us, um, whether we want it or not. And you see these things happening yet as Christians, we have this hope in what the prophecy says and what I know Jesus told us he's coming back. How does reading this reassure us of the hope of things to come? That even though, I mean, that he prophesied that the evil would come, but he also promised deliverance. Mm -hmm. So if we can see that he followed through with, um, or that he was right about his first prophecy, we can trust that he's going to be um, following through with the second part as well. And I think that um, the knowing that it's like you can ask him at any point in time to help you and he will help. I think that's also a very strong case when we read things like this, um, especially when it comes to the Jews because we know their entire story. And so there's an experiment that we will do, um, keeping God close to us. So over the next week, before we meet again, at every moment possible, try to remind, your, remind yourself that God of the universe is close enough to you to hold your hand and is personally promising you to help. So let's look at, as we're going through something, whether it's a small challenge or a large challenge, remembering that God is there to carry us through it, not even save us from it, but to just be there with us, kind of like in the um, analogy with Lindsay and her daughter with the dog. He's just there, especially when we start to fear things or become anxious or apprehensive on something and see how does how this changes 
our interactions every day and just the things that we do and how we feel um, throughout this week. So the experiment is every anytime you're anxious, you're worried, you're afraid, you or just are going through something, remember that God is close enough to hold your hand through it. And mentally see that, that God is there to walk side by side with you and kind of be that mom to protect you from the dog. Let's see how that that changes for, our outlook. For one week or for two? Let's do it for two weeks because we won't, we'll be back live in two weeks. So we'll do it for two weeks and then we'll talk about it when we come back together. Okay. All right. And so let's, so as we're going through this and, and we're going to have this like paradigm shift for these next two weeks, but where do you typically look for your hope and courage? I mean, whether it's in other people, whether it's in reading, whether it's in songs, how do you typically have, find that hope and courage to, to kind of push through? So it's funny you say that because earlier this week, my husband asked me a question about who do I go to and trust? Now, who do I go to with my, for complete honesty? And um, I thought, I was like, well, you're honest in your relationship with each other, yes. But then, I don't know, as, as women, we tend to have girlfriends that we reach out to. And so I was sharing with him because I, I have the blessing of having four sisters and then four cousin sisters. So I have a village of women that I can reach out to about situations. And one of my closest cousin sister is said to me that for the last week and this week, she is doing a no complaining and taking everything to God in prayer. And we were touching bases after my husband had asked me the question and she said, it is hard when you don't reach out to pick up that phone or to send a text or to your person you reach to and you turn to God, we've conditioned ourselves so much to reach to humans that turning to him in a situation becomes, it seems very hard, but that's what he wants us to do. I love that. You know, I think it takes some thought to really think about what, um, what do I do with my, was it stresses or my, and where do you look to find hope and courage? Hope. Mm -hmm. Hope and courage. You know, if I'm looking for hope, I will often read the Bible or listen to songs. Um, I think I bring a lot of things to my husband. I talk with my husband about, you know, a lot of, a lot of things, um, you know, cause he's there and he's in the flesh. And I think sometimes um, that's just, that's easier for us. And I think that's also why God gives us, you know, companions, um, because he knows that it is easier for us to, uh, to come to them. It's a, it's a different, it's a different way, but really the, the greatest hope, uh, the most encouragement I find is usually in the Bible or in, in music. And so let's look at um, a reason, a couple of reasons for hope. Let's flip over to Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 4 through 10. Isaiah, or Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, verses 4 through 10. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Build ye houses and dwell in them, and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city where whither I have caused you to be carried away captives, and pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof ye shall, in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. 
For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams, which ye caused to be dreamed, for they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. All right. So in these verses, we have three distinct sections. Um, in, chapter, in verse four, and it says, Thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives from whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. So it shows them how they got to Babylon, which is kind of their past. So God says, I was in control of that. And then he tells them to do all of these things to, you know, dwell and plant and take wives and sons and daughters and eat and do all these things. So Adjust. He, yes. So where you are, grow where you are planted, essentially. Um, and verses, I think that started at five. Yep. From verse five, all the way down to verse nine, which is where they are currently. And then in verse 10, it tells them, because in 70 years, I'm coming back for you. And so this is going to come to an end. So it talks about the future as well. So in these three, um, it shows the children of Israel that, or the Jews that he's in charge of the, their past, their present, and their future. When we look at this and how he did that concisely in six verses um, in Jeremiah, how does knowing that God's in control of those things change our view on where we pull our source from hope of hope from and how we should be pulling that source of hope like whether it's reading or songs or other people God affirmed that it wasn't happenstance their situation he mm -hmm. knew he was aware and then he also gives them the hope that while they're in this situation they can still lead productive lives mm -hmm. and that he will bless not just them but the people around them so if you're blessing my captives i'm sorry my captors maybe they'll turn around and be good to me also because life is good for them so there's hope in that and then he tells them that it will come to an end and in all of this that he is um the one who controls the circumstance so it goes back to a conversation we we're having earlier about the control thing they may not be in control, but they can trust that God who is in control has everything worked out. And all they need to do is trust and can go forth in the way that he's telling them it's going to work out. You know, it also, it, to me, it was speaking to the fact that our God is not limited by time. He's an eternal God. He was there before, he's there during, and he's going to be there afterwards. And he speaks, I think, in this in this timeline to make it clear to us. But um, God was always there and he's always going to continue to be there. You know, he doesn't see time the same way that we see time. Um, and that's not he doesn't he doesn't change from one time to another because he's he's the same. He just always has been. He always will be. He's. He's, he's there. He's God. And I think that um, in looking at he's always there and pulling that hope from, okay, why do I have to worry about it? A lot of times when we're going through things, we want to sulk and we go, I have, I have deserved, I deserve the right to mourn this for this long and be angry for this long or be sad for this long. And God's kind of like, I'm in, I was I, I was in control before this happened. I'm in control now. And I'm in control after it happens. Why are you being miserable? Why are you um, losing out on the time I bless you with with this emotion versus living in the moment and knowing that God has it. Whatever is going to happen, He has it. I don't need to carry it around. So I think that's kind of what I got out of that as well, especially as Janet was talking about the control thing. I like the way you just put that, be in the moment and not concerned about what happened in the past or what's going to happen in the future. A, a lot of times I find that I sit 
in the situation and then I stew about what I could have done differently in the past that is just Mm. such wasted energy (laughs) oh I I am there too and I I watched and one of our church members we all went camping and their small son um it rained on the the Friday before we got there and so it was Sabbath and we were like doing we I think we had finished worship um and the kids were just kind of transitioning and he's playing in the dirt with his car and he just has his car and he's in the mud and he has his boots and he's just happy as could be. He's not worried about the fact that it rained yesterday. He's not worried about how he has to get cleaned up. He just knows I like sitting in the mud. I have my car. I'm happy. And that was all that mattered to him. The sun is shining. It's a beautiful day. (laughs) That's a great point kids really are timeless they see Mm -hmm. this is where i am right now um sam was always telling me at various times he's saying he says you know she doesn't she's not thinking about anything like further than 15 seconds in front of her like that's it like she's not worried about what's going to happen when she does this or what's happening next she's just right there in the moment and i think you know, we're supposed to plan to some degree, but we're supposed to be trusting in God at every, at every step of the way, you know, he's taking care of me so far. I'm here. He still loves me. We're moving forward. Amen. And so let's look at when we don't quite do the things we're supposed to do in the way we're supposed to do it. Um, Some of that chastisement that we may get that heavenly love Um, from our heavenly father. So let's go over to Hebrews chapter 12 and someone can read verses five through 13. Hebrews 12, five through 13. And I have it. I'll read it in the New Living Translation. And have you entirely forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you, his children, he said. My child, don't ignore it when the Lord disciplines you and don't be discouraged when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes those he accepts as his children. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Whoever heard of a child who was never disciplined, if God Mm -hmm. doesn't discipline you as he does all his children, it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his children after all. Since we respect our earthly fathers who disciplined us, should we not more cheerfully submit to the discipline of our heavenly father and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always right and good for us because it means we will share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It is painful, but afterward, Afterward, there will be a quiet harvest of right living for those who are trained in his way. So take a new grip with your tired hands and stand firm on your shaky legs. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Then those who follow you, though they are weak and lame, will not stumble and fall, but will become strong. Mm. So why should we cherish the discipline of our Heavenly Father? There's a couple of reasons in here. I love that I didn't have to bring up the analogy of a uh, child rearing because because uh, the Bible already did. <laughs> it's already in there. That it is. Uh, what was your question, Crystal? Uh, why should we cherish the discipline from our, of our Heavenly Father? Because he knows best and because he cares for us. He's doing it for our benefit, not for his. Mm-hmm. I like when the text says, and I interpret it like this, to confirm that we are his legitimate children Mm -hmm. because the child of yours, whether by marriage or adoption, is your child. Mm -hmm. And you will be more in tune and aware and involved in their upbringing than you would of someone who you just meet as a child that may be in need. Mm -hmm. And as I think about 
God caring for us in that regards because we are his because of Jesus's shed blood. He treats us like that. So he is our father and he wants the best for us and he's not gonna allow us to step into decision-making that would cause us to experience harm. But when we do, he's going to allow us to endure the consequences, but then bring us back to where he wants us to be. And I think one of the things in the, the middle of this is that it says that discipline is never good when you're going through it, but the, the, what you reap from it is that, that quiet heavenly harvest. Um, and I think that, and that's a, a big thing for me because it's, when you discipline your children as the, the one who is disciplining, it doesn't feel good. And then as the child, it also doesn't feel good. Um, but you both know in some regards that it kind of has to happen in order to get to where you need to be because what happened was not right. Because most of the times when we send, we know that we did wrong. We know we're not, we know we're not where we're supposed to be. And we're the reason why we're being disciplined is because we ask God to help us to not do that again. Mm -hmm or help us to change these behaviors. Mm -hmm. And she's like, okay, you want to change these behaviors. This is how you have to change it. You're like, well, I don't like the way that, I, I just wanted you to, to go, it's gone. Yes, <laughs> with like, the magic wand. That's <laughs> not how this works, the, dear daughter. <laughs> um, and so during this spiritual education, how has this been a benefit to you in the past, in the present, or in the future? Or can, how can you see that being a benefit in the future? So I'll take a stab at that. Because I know God loves me and he is transforming me so that I will be the person that he created me to be as I go through the discipline, even though I don't like it, I hold fast to the knowledge of knowing I'm going to come out better than how I went into it. And don't get me wrong, because I know when things happen, I am the first to complain and be like, really? You allow this to happen, really? And Holy Spirit gently goes, yeah, but when you first approach it, I gave you a way out, but you didn't take it. Mm -hmm. And then there's that, what I call the soft chastisement. So the discipline for me at times is not the pain of the consequences. It is the reminder that I disappointed, even though he gave me a way out. Because mm -hmm. he tells us there's no temptation that um, comes our way that we are not given what we need to overcome it. Mm -hmm. So... So how does that work in the future? I'm supposed to learn my lesson. <laughs> you know, it also makes me, you know, as we compare it, it makes me think I really shouldn't be complaining, you know, because, you know, anytime you, you discipline your kid, there's this, there's a, this uh, complaining that comes with it, you know, but then I'd like to think, you know, I'm an adult. You know, I've been following the Lord for this amount of time. I wouldn't be complaining, right? If it were me, because obviously this is what's good for me and they're going to, you know, I'm going to survive it. We're going to move on. But no, I mean, we have the same, this, you have the same lessons to learn, the same, the same uh, situation. It's just another grade. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're going to send that email. We're recording. Oh. <laughs> And so as we, um, we look at Friday's lesson and we wrap up, I have, there's a, a section that I wanted to read to you all. And this was written by Ellen G. White. And it says, into the experience of all, there comes times of keen disappointment and utter discouragement. Days when sorrow is the portion and it is hard to believe that God is still the kind benefactor of his earthborn children. Days when, child, when troubles harass the soul till death seems preferable to life. It is then that many lose their hold on God 
and are brought into slavery of doubt, the bondage of, and the bondage of unbelief. Could we at such times discern with spiritual insight the meaning of God's providences? We should see angels seeking to save us from ourselves, striving to plant our feet upon a foundation more firm than the everlasting hills, and new faith, new life would spring into being. So with that said, it was it hit me when it said that the angels were saving us from ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's a completely different lesson. We could probably <laughs> spend an entire another hour just talking about that and how um wow when we get disappointed in God, we actually do more harm to ourselves than God could ever do. That's another lesson outside of the angel saves us from ourselves that we won't talk about right now. But as promised, I'm coming back to my original question. How do we build a hope not based on who we think God should be, but on who he actually is? I think it comes down to trust, right? It comes down to trusting that, um, that God will um, do what's best for us and that he has the situation under control. Um, not that we know what's going to happen next, but that we can simply trust that he He's good and he will um he he won't give us more than we can bear. He'll he'll uh care for us. Amen. Janet, you have anything you want to throw in there? I go back to our reading of Job mm -hmm. when God asks all the questions. And as Lindsay said, you trust. But for those of us who need a little extra help, we verify. And that verification is who God says he is. The I am. We stand on that and let his track record of the past and his promises hold us on that foundation. And I think in just bringing back that Job 38, 39, um, the more you spend time with God, the more we will understand who he is. And building that relationship is hard to understand who a stranger is when you meet them for the first time and you see them once a year. You never really truly get a full understanding of who they are. But the, the more time you spend with someone that's thinking about human to human interaction, the more you start to understand their idiosyncrasies, their personality, their their the traits, their character traits, um, even their mannerisms. Um, so the more time we spend with God, the more we will truly understand who he actually is. And those things will stick with us because you ever been around someone and let's say as a coworker or someone you're around constantly and you find yourself picking up phrases or mannerisms or just like different things from them. The more we spend time with God, the more we'll pick up on his mannerisms and his traits and understand, even if we don't like it, which when this we're disciplined, we won't um, we go, you know, God, I know why you did this. I don't like what that, that I'm going through this, but I understand this is part of who you are so that I can become more like you. Mm -hmm. So with that, we will wrap up our Sabbath school lesson for this week. Thank you both so much for uh, all of your wonderful discussion and answers and participation in this. And we will ask Sister Lindsay to um, close us in prayer. Sure, let's pray. Lord in heaven, we thank you so much for um, this lesson. Lord, we, we don't just thank you for what you've given us in this time, but Lord, we thank you for being great and for being good and for loving us. And Lord, please help us to take time this week um, to simply dwell on who you are and to seek you. Um, in the various situations and trials that we might have, Lord, that we might simply um, keep our eyes fixed on you. And we ask that all of those people listening um, uh, over this recording, Lord, that they might um, 
also take that challenge to simply keep their eyes and their minds focused on you through this week, Lord. Um, help us to trust you and thank you for being who you are. We ask these things in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. And we hope you all have a happy Sabbath and you join us next week as we will study seeing the invisible. So have a wonderful Sabbath and we'll see you then. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath.